Hey, we're back. We're live. We're here with Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel here on a Thursday with Colin Moore, Professor Colin Moore, uh, who is a professor of political science at uh, UH Manoa. Uh, thank you for joining us, Colin. It's great to have you on the show. My pleasure to be here, Jay. We're going to talk about, you know, what seems to be obvious, that is uh, how, how the coronavirus is affecting government, um, political science, if you will, um, and thus uh, our, our our state, our country, our lives. Uh, so you must be watching this with great interest because what existed before no longer exists. And we are in this huge um, political transformation now. It goes way beyond what Donald Trump was doing before. And it affects the very underpinnings of, of, um, of our lives together in, in this country. So uh, can, can we talk about one government at a time? Can we talk about, for example, state government? How has the coronavirus crisis affected state government here in Hawaii? I mean, I think the, the most obvious thing is the, the legislature is shut down right now. I mean, so the legislative session is suspended, um, which makes it difficult to respond with legislation um, to some of these problems. So, so that's one issue. I mean, the, the second, of course, is that it's already beginning to strain the state's resources, and we're not even the most affected state. I mean, I think Hawaii actually is so far in a pretty good position um, with fewer than 300 uh, COVID-19 cases. But we also don't have a lot of capacity here. Um, we actually have less hospital capacity than a lot of states, so um, it could become very serious. Um, you can already, already see it straining the relationship of some politicians, most famously um, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green and Governor David Ige, who I guess have made up now, but for a long time um, really were publicly fighting um, about the response uh, to the point uh, which uh, at least the media accused the governor of banning the lieutenant governor from some of these briefings. Um, so, um, but, but all in all, I think that the state is, the state of Hawaii has responded reasonably well. Um, governor Ige eventually put into place um, the, uh, the quarantine. Um, they've more or less stopped um, tourism um, and even inter island flights now. So, um, it's going to continue to strain the state's resources, but um, you know, I sort of give the state of Hawaii's response about a B plus for, to this. Uh, can we unpack that a little bit? You get the substantive response, and then you get the communications response to the public. Sure. Uh, how would you? Uh, does the B plus apply to both, or is there a difference between the the substantive response and, and the communications response? Sure. That's a good point. Um, I'd actually give a, a, a higher grade to the substantive response than the communication response in, in some ways. Um, I mean, we were an early state, um, particularly given the number of cases we had um, to recommend um, self-quarantining, social distancing, all of these practices. I mean, we predated a lot of states on the mainland, um, you know, most notoriously Florida that had a bigger problem that also had a tourism economy. Uh, so I'll give, uh, I'll give the state credit for that. Um, you know, the legislature shut down pretty early, um, the university shut down relatively early. And I hope, like we've seen on the West Coast states, California um, in particular, that that's really going to help us because right now you see California with relatively few cases. The communication probably could have been a bit better. I mean, Governor Ige is not Andrew Cuomo or Gavin Newsom, um, who seem to have really, you know, with their daily press conferences shown that they're in charge. I mean, there's been an attempt uh, to to replicate that by Governor Ige, but I don't think it's been quite so so effective. But I don't think it's been terrible either. Actually, I think Hawaii, like I said, has done a reasonably good job because there's a lot that they can't do. The state has limited resources. That is limited funding. Um, it has um, it doesn't have the ability to access these federal stockpiles. So um, so overall, I mean, I, and we were talking about this before this show started. Even the states have really been the stars of this response, and the federal government has really been falling down on the job. Yeah. So now we have, I mean, you know, I, and I suppose it's worth uh, talking about how this happened. We have the legislature stopping mid mid course 
taking a recess, which presumably will go on for a long time, maybe even till next next session next year, um, where it's unable to do anything. And there are committees in both the House and the Senate that are talking about the coronavirus. And I don't, I don't know what that means. Uh, legislatures, yes, they talk, but they also adopt statutes. Um, and uh, they're not able to adopt any statutes. Uh, they're in talking mode. I, I don't know if they're talking to the governor. I don't know if they're overseeing departments. Uh, uh, and I wonder if is, there's any function whatsoever in, in these um, in detached uh, committees that are now uh, talking after the recess began. This, this is, this is a, a really a big test of state government when you, when you close down the legislature. That's a problem, isn't it? It's a, it's a huge problem. I mean, an unprecedented one, um, you know, outside of occasional uh, you know, wartime decisions, which, um, uh, which are exceedingly rare. So I, I mean, I think that they, they've made a, a good faith effort to try to at least use their function as elected officials to coordinate responses from agencies, um, to coordinate with uh, the governor, but they really do need to be back in session. And some states are actually experimenting with running the legislature remotely. Now, there's, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of objections to that about security and other things, but I really think it's something they need to seriously consider because this will likely drag on for quite some time. Certainly, many members of the legislature are the very sort of people who can be the most vulnerable to this, to this um, virus. They're older. Uh, so I don't really see any reason why we can't really begin to seriously investigate remote operations. This is already happening in Pennsylvania, um, you know, uh, and we have the advantage of being a united democratic state. So there's not going to be as many party line votes that might make this difficult. So I, I think it's time for them to seriously consider this um, because I think that is a much better alternative, whatever risk there is to security. And I think there are easy workarounds for that. Um, you know, I think the much greater risk is we just don't have elected officials able to do their job and to pass legislation. Um, and that could go on for quite some time. Yeah, but to fix it is going to be a her Herculean uh, mission because, you know, the provision calling for in personam votes uh, on the floor of the House and the Senate is in the Constitution. Um, so you has got to fix the Constitution first. And Gee, that's a that's a big problem. In terms of workarounds, I mean, I, there are logical things that come to mind. For example, they can have straw votes that are later affirmed when they get together. But getting together isn't so easy because even flying from the neighbor islands, you you have a fourteen day quarantine period, um, and you know, and that that applies to legislators right. as well. I suppose right. I suppose right. David Ike, who created the fourteen day quarantine period, could accept exempt the legislators. They could come in and have a short, a short meeting, a short session, if you will, simply to affirm a bunch of bills that they had straw votes on, uh, and and get about their business. And maybe there's other ways too, but it it strikes Actually, me there, that there, there's, there there uh, are some even more creative ways. Um, I think it. Um, I'm not sure which state it was, but they started meeting in a huge basketball stadium so they could maintain the six feet of social distancing, but still operate. So maybe there's something like that, which sounds silly, but it might actually be a practical workaround. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, all right. That's that's a problem for the state. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, you said it's going to go on for a long time, and I agree with you. Uh, so here we're going to be next January, and it's not clear that we're going to be back in in normalcy again. In fact, I would I would venture to say we're not going to be back in normalcy again, not on anything and not on state government either. And, and that leads to the problem of, of funding of fiscal policy, uh, where you really need money for the state to do its duty to help people sort of the state, uh, the state, uh, you know, uh, so, social safety net. Uh, but we, we really can't get the money together. Uh, any any thoughts about how that can be handled, especially in a state where the Constitution says you have to balance the budget? Exactly. And, and we're not the only state like this. I mean, this is really the, the problem that state governments face. I mean, unlike the federal government, which can create money through the Federal Reserve um, and doesn't have these sort of limitations. So the only way really to do that is through federal funding. Um, and the act passed by Congress will help with a bit of that, but there may just need to be more direct transfers um, 
to state government through some mechanism. They experimented with parts of this during the last financial crisis. But I think that's that's really the only way. Um, I mean, because state government and Hawaii in particular is going to suffer tremendously from this. I mean, the, the forecast from the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization, you know, are projecting maybe 30% unemployment. I mean, tourism is going to be one of the last industries that comes back. So this is going to be an unbelievable financial crisis for Hawaii, unlike anything we've ever seen, I think, before. Um, and so I think just keeping basic operations going is going to become a challenge without robust federal support. Now, the benefit, I mean, not the benefit, rather, let me rephrase that. One, one reason I'm optimistic is that this is going to hit red states as hard as it hits blue states. In some ways, it might hit the red states even harder. Um, we tend to be more dependent on, on federal revenues to begin with um, and have sicker populations often. Um, and so I expect, like you saw with, with the most recent bailout package, to increase in unemployment benefits and, and all the rest, relatively bipartisan support because everyone's in this together. Um, and so that that actually may end up helping um, and getting more federal money to uh, to help the states. Yeah, you mentioned the new federalism, um, and I, I would like to explore that a little bit. You know, we we've, we've had this tension actually from the beginning. Am I right? From the very beginning, the role of the federal government versus the role of the states. And now we find. We, we were focusing on the federal government for the longest time. A lot of politics went into that. Uh, and now we're looking back to the states as the, as the viable option in, in the time of crisis. And the state governors are making deals among themselves. They're cooperating. It's really, it's nice to see, except in the long term, it, it may not work for a country of 330 million people. What do you think about that? Exactly. I mean, like I said before, the governors, uh, have really been the stars of the response to this crisis, partly because the federal government has performed so terribly uh, that I think they basically looked around and decided, well, we're, we've are we got to take care of our own state because the feds aren't going to come in and bail us out. Um, you know, and to some extent, this is the why we have federalism. This is what it was supposed to achieve was that you know, governors know their states better. They can make decisions more quickly on the ground. So we're actually seeing uh, some of what our founders hoped would happen uh, come to pass here. The trouble is, like I said before, states just have very limited resources um, because they have these balanced budget requirements because they can't access, um, um, you know, they certainly don't have access to the US military with the exception of the National Guard. And so there's gonna come a point where they're not able to, to function. And they're also probably very unlikely to start really restricting movements across state borders. There's gonna be legal questions about that. So we were, we've moved so far in the direction, you know, in the 20th century of strengthening the federal government, it's pretty hard to go, to go back now. I mean, everything is really built into this assumption that the federal government is going to be there for emergencies. I mean, it's for precisely reasons like this, like the pandemic, that we gave the president so much power, that we gave so much power over to the federal government and federal agencies was because the thought was the states aren't really equipped to handle this themselves. The trouble is the federal government is not is not really delivering on its promise. Yeah, something you uh, you raised a minute ago, I I can't um, I can't not ask you about. Um, it's it's about the militia. Uh, it's about the fellows with with the guns. Um, it's about the National Guard. It's about the U.S. Army, which which has been in play under Trump. Um, you know, for doing things other than national defense. And now you have, um, you know, the Teddy Roosevelt, uh, the Theodore Roosevelt uh, aircraft carrier with uh, 5,000 right. souls aboard and, and they're completely dysfunctional um, because of the virus out in, was it Guam? So, you know, the problem there is the military is somehow in play in this because, and I go back to something else you mentioned, you know, if we can't solve this problem, if it goes on and on, we're talking about social order. Uh, we're talking about, um, you know, a situation where the government is so non-functional and, and the people are in such distress that you worry about social order. And that's when we talk about the military, either the National Guard military or the, or the federal military. And uh, uh, just to tell you, in, in certain academic circles on the mainland, they're talking about issues relating to martial law, martial law to quell disturbances that may arise as a consequence or part of the coronavirus, you know, crisis. 
Uh, thoughts about that? Well, I'm 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 hopeful that, that we don't get there. Although it, I, I, I'm not going to say it's not going to happen. Actually, because if you're talking about 30 percent unemployment, I mean um, mass panic. I mean all everything we're trying to do is to prevent that. But it doesn't mean it's not going to happen in some places. Um, and uh, that's just an incredibly dangerous situation uh, to be in because um, any time when I mean, you are using the military to, and people's civil liberties are suspended. Um, I I fear for I fear for our democracy, particularly given the current federal leadership. Um, but this, we we really don't have. I mean, there's no nothing you can really compare this to that easily, except for maybe some things that happened during World War II. Um, and so I, uh, I I hope martial law is not declared anywhere, um, but it wouldn't surprise me if it is at some point for, I hope, a very brief period of time. Um, uh, I think we're just in a position that we've never really been in in this country. This is why there was always so much done to prevent pandemics, um, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. how, how, do you, how, how do you control order when people are sick, when um, everyone is unemployed? Um, I mean, when you begin to even become worried about the ability to deliver enough food, and we're, we're hardly there yet. I mean, I don't think we will get there. Um, but it's, uh, it's a dangerous time. And, you know, and the other thing I'll mention in relation to that is also it scares me a little bit how people have processed information about COVID-19. Some of the political science studies that are just uh, freshly out have shown that because of the vacillation by President Trump on whether or not this was a hoax or it was just like the flu or something serious, people's decision to social distance and take this seriously is determined in many ways by their partisanship. In other words, the most conservative Republicans are the ones who still are the least likely to take this uh, the most seriously because everything today is filtered through this partisan lens. So I think in some cases, this has brought people more closely together. Um, but in other cases, uh, you're seeing, um, even in the response to something like a virus, uh, the danger of the intense polarization uh, that has occurred in this country over the last 20 years. Yeah, and the executive, the executive branch, you know, it's been happening for a long time. It's just more powerful than it ever was. And and we have uh, situations where, for example, everybody thinks of Rosie the Riveter. Uh, they think of World War II. They think of a full court press. We get our act together. We save the world. But that hasn't happened. And I, I, I do not understand exactly why why we haven't made that full court press. Uh, we, we seem, he seems to get lost uh, on a myriad of unrelated issues, including uh, arguments that uh, the impeachment proceedings stood in the way of his action on the current, which is ridiculous. Um, so the, the one that sticks in my mind is the, uh, what is it, the Defense Production Act, sure. which, which, was in, which, which could be a big solution here. And for some reason, our federal government is really not playing that card. Is this, is this a political thing? Uh, is it a matter of just uh, being oblivious? Uh, do, you, do you understand what has happened here? Uh, wouldn't it be obvious that we should avail ourselves of that all across the board? Uh, I think so. I mean, I think one, one thing that we're seeing partly is it's, it's more of an ideological thing than, than just a strict political thing. I think that um, there was, there's a lot of resistance to, to use the power of the federal government to uh, from from Trump and from the people in the administration to order American industry to do things. I think partly because they themselves underestimated how serious this was, um, and also because I just don't think it's with their their ideological image very well. Um, you know, and that I think has been the the mistake that that has occurred in this response, which is that I mean, and maybe understandably because people didn't understand the severity, um, but this sense that oh well, you can have it both ways. You don't really have to shut shut down the economy and, and, and devote all your resources to fighting the virus. We can just do a little bit of that and keep everything running. I mean, that's unlike what finally happened in World War II under Roosevelt, where everything was devoted to the war effort. And I think that's, that's what we need to be thinking about right now. Uh, there's going to be tremendous economic devastation, but we're never going to be able to recover until people are safe until we have enough equipment for hospitals, um, until the virus is under control, everything else really doesn't matter at this point. 
Um, and I think maybe the Trump administration is beginning to realize that, but much longer, it took them much longer than it should have. And it's not just Trump, I should say this. I mean, um, you can look at European leaders like Boris Johnson, who also didn't take it as seriously as they should have, uh, governors, um, uh, particularly governors in the South. Um, and so I think that's really been the trouble is this sense, and, and it's one that comes from, I think, Republicans and their sense that, that they should protect business at all costs um, that uh, has led to this delayed response. Yeah, and your, your point about Europe is touching because when you look at a world map and see the effect of the coronavirus on the world everywhere, every continent, huge numbers in, in countries that have no infrastructure to deal with it, but have huge populations that are all proximate and uneducated about what to do. So you know, this is this is so big, and the problem is that we're all—it's a flat world. We're all related, so that even if we quell it in the U.S., you know, and it goes wild somewhere else, it's going to creep back into the U.S. We should be concerned about everywhere in the world. There needs to be a world leader, don't you think? I mean, we're talking about a global government here, or at least global leadership, uh, and we we really don't have that. I don't see the. Uh, uh, WHO has that kind of leader. So the result no. is that <clears throat> you have to have world leadership, but we don't have that either. Probably. Right. This is a global problem. And yet, at the very time we need some sort of more global leadership, what we see is uh, countries uh, thickening their borders again. You see this in Europe and everywhere else, um, trying to protect their trying to protect their own. Um, and uh, I mean, that's partly human nature. Um, but it's not going to be effective in this case because the virus doesn't respect these borders. Um, yeah. And I'm hopeful maybe, uh, well, I should say I'm hopeful, but I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think we're going to see a huge push to uh, some sort of global effort. I mean, it's not like it is in the science fiction movies when the aliens are invading. Uh, we're not all rallying around, um, you know, some, some sense of... Uh, uh, of trying to protect the world, it seems like we're retreating into kind of our nationalist caves. Which is not sustainable. So let's turn to the, the last uh, major issue for you and I to discuss, and that is the election. We've been fighting about the election um, for, well, for the whole Trump administration, isn't it? And uh, well, fighting, no, fighting, exactly. fighting, and now this. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, this how it affects the election is, I mean, students are going to be writing dissertations about this for decades. Um, well, Trump got a little bit of a bump, um, as, uh, as anyone who watches the polls can see, it's basically as high as he's been since he's been president at 46%. Um, yeah, that's not surprising. There's always this rally around the flag effect with disasters. Um, although he hasn't gotten nearly the bump that many European leaders got or governors. I mean, Andrew Cuomo's bump in New York, for example, has been extraordinary. Um, I think it really depends on, on first how people begin to evaluate the performance of the federal government and the president, how many people die from this, um, and, um, and how quickly the economy can recover. Um, I mean, I think this is very damaging to his reelection chances. But at the same time, he's on TV all the time. Um, Biden has really been crowded out. The Democrats um, you know, have a, a, a problem because they don't wanna politicize the reaction to the virus. That's not gonna play well either. Um, and, and now is a difficult time to criticize the president. So it's, it's tough to tell how, how this is gonna affect the election. Although if you were to push me today, I'd say that this is really gonna hurt Donald Trump's election, reelection chances. Yeah, but um, I don't. I don't know about the primaries. I don't know about the convention. Uh, just like oh. you can't have a legislative session without, um, you know, without a way of communicating and getting in a room somehow, either virtually or really, uh, you can't have a convention either. And if we don't have a convention, you know, that leaves the Democrats in a in a funny spot. Um, and I don't know what Bernie's going to do. I mean, the better part of it for Bernie would be to withdraw and let let Biden be the candidate. But he's not doing. That. I hope he does that soon. Um, so anyway, we have so we have questions around that the whole process that leads to the selection of a, a Democratic candidate. Uh, and meanwhile, Trump is in the Rose Garden every day, um, you know, rallying uh, and, and making statements that he thinks are useful for his political future. And then 
you get to the election itself, November. As you, as you mentioned, Colin, we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know how the voting procedures are going to be. Uh, we, we don't have a, here in this state, we don't have a legislature that can reorganize the voting procedures um, and make them more virtual. I, I don't know if that's possible. Um, bottom line is, um, you know, the, the result, as you mentioned earlier, is questionable. And we, we may have a, a fight, an argument, a hanging chat, may I say, a hanging chat type of argument that, that can't be resolved so quickly as to who really won and whether he's entitled to stay on January 20th. I'm very concerned about the future of the Republic for the lack of an election that everybody respects. How do you see this unfolding in the next few months? It's it's going to be it's going to be very difficult. I mean, we in Hawaii at least are fortunate in that we already decided to move to mail in ballot. This was going to be the first election uh, in which that occurred. And there's many many states that have moved to mail in as well, but many that haven't. Um, and so I don't really know how they're going to vote. Um, I don't believe you can delay the presidential election. Um, that uh, I don't think will be possible. Um, so I'm worried that. Uh, if there's, for example, a decision by most states to go mail-in, which may be likely, um, then I'm worried that people will consider those votes illegitimate, or even worse, that there'll be a, a winner announced on election night that's one person, and then as the mail-in votes trickle in, it'll change the eventual outcome, which will be very easy for people to claim fraud um, and uh, demand that the or, or, or claim that the election wasn't secure. I think we're at a very dangerous time in our democracy. Um, I'm not going to lie about that. And um, I don't really know, I don't know how we're going to get out of it. Um, I think that, um, um, I mean, I would like to say that, that it would be a good time for people to care more about the Republic than their own narrow, narrow partisan interests. Um, but I don't really think that's going to, going to happen. Um, and so unless it's just an overwhelming victory for Trump or Biden, um, I'm really worried that they're uh, going to be considered illegitimate. Or if the virus is, um, you know, still on a rampage or, you know, a second wave rampage, uh, Trump might say this is not the time for an election. Let's, let's hold up on this. And then you, and then you get a, a kind of 1933 approach to things. Right. Right, right. I mean, that would be that would be the ultimate nightmare. Um, you know, the one thing you, you said a minute ago that that uh, really catches me is um, this whole notion about how a, a crisis like this should bring us together because we're all affected. The virus doesn't know boundaries. It doesn't know ideologies. It doesn't know political positions. And yet, even in the crunch here being threatened in every way, being involved in a, a terrible negative transform, transformational experience, um, we still have division. We've had division for the past three years at least, and now we still have division. And you'd think that it would bring us together. That's what everybody says. This should be bringing us together. And yet, I don't feel confident that it is bringing us together. And I guess you don't either. Uh, I don't now. I mean, it's possible as this gets worse and as people experience, everyone begins to experience um, it affecting their own family and friends in a way that it already is, is happening in New York City. Uh, we, we may see more of that, um, you know, as this becomes this personal threat, uh, these ideological concerns and, and partisan concerns will go away. And you've seen a bit of that. Um, for example, people coming on board with policies like social distancing um, when they were more divided before. Um, but I'm, I'm worried about how easy it has been to poison people's minds through fake media, through conspiracy theories, um, and, um, um, and, continue to, and continue to keep them divided. Um, I think that this will be a test that, that no one alive um, uh, with the exception of some very, very old people have, have ever really faced in the United States. Um, and I think how we respond to this crisis really will dictate how the country fares for the next 50 years. Yeah, it will redefine us. And there's one other last question I would like to ask you. This is a question that I've been meaning to ask you since we set up this show, and that is this. Um, Donald Trump has changed his position 
He regularly lies and misstates the facts, even on critical, critical life and death issues. And yet his base continues to support him. Uh, it really, it bothers me, for example, that uh, the conservative people are attacking Fauci, uh, who is clearly a credible, a credible person in the landscape. So what you, what you have is the base is acting perhaps on what he said before, they're not picking up on what he's saying now, or maybe they're getting other, you know, sub, sub, sub messages from him uh, that, that, that make them so, so troubled. And why the base supports him, why his, his ratings have gone up when it's obvious how many footfalls he has had and subjected us to over the past few weeks at a time of crisis astounds me. The base is supporting him, his ratings are going up. Why, Colin? There must be a good political science reason why. Well, I mean, this is Trump's, the loyalty of Trump's base is extraordinary for, for any president, but I think it's, it's, it's tribalism um, because people have now defined themselves as Trump supporters um, and any, any information that indicates that he's not doing a good job is just, is just rejected or considered an attempt by his enemies to try to, uh, uh, to try to get him to lose the election. I mean, I, I don't think we've ever seen anything quite, quite like this. Um, I mean, but it also on the flip side, it also explains why even in a crisis situation like this, he's not able to gain support um, because independents and Democrats have determined a long time ago that no matter what he does, uh, they don't like him. Um, and so he will continue to be stuck with this group of intensely loyal supporters. Um, I really can't explain entirely um, their deep affection for him. I'm not sure anyone really can. I think it's a combination of getting the policies they've wanted, um, some respect for authoritarianism, um, a feeling like he represents them um, in a way that, that past Republican presidents haven't. Um, but it is a, a, a poisonous combination of identity politics and, um, you know, a certain American paranoia. Well, one thing is clear, Colin, it's not over. In fact, it's subject to a dynamic as we watch every single day. We watch it change, we watch new and horrendous events taking place, new and horrendous numbers. And I hope that I can circle back with you in a few weeks um, to see how you feel about those changes and, and see how it is affecting our future. Tell me you'll be available. I'll be available. I think we're at the end of the beginning now. Um, and so now we're going to start the, uh, a, a much more dangerous phase. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to have to have a, a, gim a gimlet immediately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Colin. Thanks for coming thank around. Thanks for these thoughts. Really appreciate it. You take care. Stay safe. Aloha.